The shadow is a moral problem that challenges the whole ego personality, for no one can become conscious of the shadow without considerable moral effort. To become conscious of it involves recognising the dark aspects of the personality as present and real. Swiss psychologist Carl Jung is one of the most important figures from the 20th century in the fields of psychology and philosophy, and in today's video we look at one of the most important ideas to have come from him, the idea of the shadow. The shadow is an aspect of us all that is often repressed by many as they don't want to identify with that element of who they are, but rather serves a utility in our lives and is important to identify and integrate into ourselves and our state of being, helping us be more complete individuals. To help understand this idea, I will be referring to talks Jordan Peterson has done on the subject, as I feel he explained it quite well, and in a way that's easy to understand. So without wasting any further time, let's start by asking ourselves, what is the shadow? The shadow comes from our unconscious, or is even sometimes identified as the unconscious, and is often deemed to be a dark and elusive side of ourselves, hence Jung calling it the shadow. For many, the ego either doesn't acknowledge the shadow or represses it, which is a causation of chaos in the lives of many people according to Jung. You see, just as people are able to do acts of good in their lives, whether it be through acts of kindness or support, people are equally capable to have the proclivity to do acts of evil. Often, when we act out either, it comes from the unconscious as a natural, even instinctive response. And this explains the importance of identifying with the shadow, because whether we want to or not, it will manifest itself in some form or another in our lives. So why is integrating the shadow important? We've already touched on this previously in identifying that the shadow will manifest in our lives whether we want it to or not, and fundamentally this is why it's important to consciously integrate it into our lives, so that we can have control over how we act in relation to others. For example, as a father I can relate to this in terms of being a parent. No matter how much you love someone, they will do things that will negatively affect you at times, and for children this is common as they haven't matured as individuals and are therefore often still developing their understanding of civility and the responsibility of their actions. Parents who struggle with the integration of the shadow often allow the dark side of themselves to take a hold of their reactions to their child's misdemeanours which is where we sometimes see the act of abuse taking place, resulting in feelings of regret. On the other hand, a parent who has acknowledged and integrated their shadow is much more likely and capable of reacting in a way that serves a purpose, such as disciplining the child in a way that teaches them right from wrong, whilst reducing the risk of causing them significant harm. Again, it goes back to the point raised earlier we're all capable of acts of evil, so it's important to have it in check and controlled, than letting it manifest itself in ways that's ultimately destructive. Lord of the Flies One of my favourite books that delves into the concept of the shadow is William Golding's Lord of the Flies. In the book, a group of children are stranded on an island after a plane crash and we see them devolve from civilization to becoming very much primal over the course of the story, performing horrendous acts of violence in the process. In the case of the characters in the story, especially those with a more aggressive nature, they effectively repress the shadow by identifying the acts of evil being the acts of a beast rather than coming from them but this results in it manifesting itself in a way which is far worse than had they been capable of confronting it and using it in a way that they knew was productive and of value. Simon, one of the key characters in the story, is one who confronts the beast and identifies it as something that's within each of the boys and not a separate entity. It's hard to accept and is one of the most critical junctures of the story, as with this revelation he symbolises hope for the group, which ultimately ends in his death and events that are comparable to hell. 
You see, had the boys been capable of integrating the shadow, they had a significantly better chance of maintaining a level of civility that would have led to a far more productive way of living on the island. However, they instead repressed this side of themselves, and the one who did confront it, Simon, did so in a moment that was of great internal conflict and turmoil. This is important to understand, as Jung acknowledges the difficulty in confronting the shadow and the process of integrating it into the conscious. The reason is, it's hard to control and morally conflictive, and therefore hard to adapt to purposeful needs, but doing so is a necessity. Jordan Peterson on Becoming a Monster Jordan Peterson explains the reason for integrating the shadow extremely well, as he often talks about the idea of becoming a monster. I've previously done a video on this idea when talking about DC's Batman, so it's worth a watch if you want to delve deeper. In principle, when Jordan Peterson speaks of becoming the monster, what he says is that whether we want to or not, we always become a monster in life as part of our maturity. As you take on more responsibility, sometimes it means to accept that you will have to let elements of the shadow integrate with your conscious behaviour to serve utility in a given circumstance. One such example is when I spoke about acting as a parent and disciplining a child, in this case utilising the shadow to discipline the child in a way that's useful for their growth, rather than being abusive. Another example Jordan Peterson gives is when you have to deal with the passing of a loved one, say a parent. In this circumstance, you will be a monster either way, because you either mourn and let that control your behaviour, resulting in a lack of action in a time where your maturity is needed, or you accept the death, and push through to take the action required of you in that moment. In both scenarios, you become the monster, because on the one hand you're incapable of being of value in a time of need and instead risk becoming a burden, whereas in the other you're able to act and even if in mourning, people can question how you're able to do so having lost someone who raised you from birth. By integrating the shadow and thus taking on the role of the monster, it's always better to be the second option, as while taking action can be construed as a heartless act, albeit most people understand in such circumstances, staying strong and capable in such a situation serves a utility, not just in organising the necessary processions that come with death, but also being able to support those around you and be able to move on in a healthy way. Using the shadow Having discussed the shadow and the purpose of integrating it into our lives, we've come to realise the importance of doing so, as if we don't, we can't predict how it will manifest itself in our lives. Carl Jung was particularly interested in World War II when conceptualising the idea of the shadow, and spent time trying to understand the behaviours of the Nazi soldiers. What's often quite disconcerting to people is that many of the soldiers were very much normal people, who lived normal lives. And this is what's important to understand about using the shadow, that we're all capable of acts of great evil within us, and if left unchecked, we could see it manifest itself in ways that might seem unimaginable today. With this in mind, I want to clarify it's not that the shadow is necessarily just evil within us, but I'll let the words of Jung explain this better than I could hope to do. If it has been believed hitherto that the human shadow was the source of all evil, it can now be ascertained on closer investigation that the unconscious man, that is, his shadow, does not consist of only morally reprehensible tendencies, but also displays a number of good qualities, such as normal instincts, appropriate reactions, realistic insight, creative impulses, etc. Were you aware of the concept of the shadow from Carl Jung? Let me know in the comments section below. If it's of interest, I'm also keen to explore further into this subject, such as going deeper into the ideas of projection. Please like, share and subscribe as we help you live life on your terms. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to ensure YouTube notifies you of the latest uploads. Thanks for watching.